and welcome to another video of Lit Revision. Many of you wanted a video for the Edexcel syllabus. In today's video, I'll go over the picture of Dorian Gray's context and plot summary. First, let us look at who was Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde is one of the most treasured national icons in the English canon from the Victorian period. He grew up and studied in Dublin before moving to Oxford to further his studies. He soon became a fashionable and intellectual writer. He was quite involved in the London scene at a time when the philosophy of asceticism was becoming very popular. The wit of his language and tightly wrought themes and plots of his stories gained him a literary reputation, whilst his personal life also attracted attention. Wilde was known for his flamboyant style. Just look at that jacket. Controversial, th controversial themes that are today widely thought to be connected with his personal life. One aspect of his life was his homosexuality homosexuality which was targeted by his detractors and in 1895 he was imprisoned for many years following what is widely known as the wild trials. The famous wild trials were not only notorious because they were in the, the equivalent of say a Beyonce scandal but also because the nature of it was wild in the Victorian societal view, no pun intended. In the years of his imprisonment Wilde wrote his most tragic poems after his release, he moved to France and died there. In order to understand the picture of Dorian Gray to the best of our abilities, the Wild Trials give us important historical and uncultural context. Sorry. The trials concern the then 40-year-old Wilde's relationship with a 24-year-old man called Lord Alfred, or rather Douglas. I urge you to look up the trials on revision sites like Cliff Notes and check out the Wikipedia page on the trials to get a sense of what this book meant at the time it was written. In the first trial, he was asked several questions about the picture of Dorian Gray and the relationships between older and younger men in the novel. He was accused of relationships with other young men, not just Lord Alfred. We see that here, we see that his own creation was used against him, literally. In terms of the historical context of the text, the novel's depiction of Victorian London seems to draw a lot from the historical events and fashions of the era, at a time where opium dens made drugs like opium, obviously, and heroin readily available. It's no surprise that Wilde decides to incorporate this to highlight her Dorian's hedonism. Indeed, Dorian's excursions into these particularly seedy worlds relate to the underground city obsession fashion and addiction of opium. This speaks volumes about the legacy of the opium wars. Twice before 1860, the British government, unwilling to pay in silver for its massive tea imports from China, went to war to force China to import and buy opium from Britain. According to the British firm who profited most, they claimed that it was not a curse but a comfort and benefit to the hard-working Chinese. And to us, in today's society, this seems like a disgusting thing to say. Another point of, about the historical background of Dorian Gray is that this was a time in which the words unemployment and slum were coined. The gap between the rich and the poor have never, had never been wider. It was a time of economic, political and social unrest. It's perhaps noteworthy that this was the invention age. The age that gave us the telephone, wireless telegraph, cinematography and electric lights. It also produced Darwin's highly influential 1859 Origins of Species, which shaped both literary and social studies as the branch of Darwinism evolved, no pun intended. Psychiatry, psychology and other studies of the psyche also were introduced. In 1891, William James described a number of real-life cases of alternating personalities, suggesting that the human mind was capable of fragmentation. Before long, these studies moved towards sexuality and sexual difference. On the topic of sexuality, Austro-Hungarian doctor Carolee Bunker or Karl Maria Kemberti, now different sources have his name different, spelled differently, in 1869 coined the term homosexual and psychiatrist Richard von Kraft Ebbing considered homosexual to be not criminal but victims of heredity or upbringing with no choice, as opposed to what he called the perverse, who deliberately, deliberately sorry, acted against their nature for sexual thrills or money. With this, 
links between crime and sexuality gave rise to a variety of new legislation. As syphilis became a serious problem, the government's first solution was the Contagious Diseases Act of 1861. This empowered police to force pro suspected prostitutes to be examined. This outraged many women as just walking alone warranted an invasive exa examination. These women demanded male accountability in the rise of syphilis. This was a world of sexually transmitted diseases from poor contraception practices and a world where gender and sexuality struggles were arising, whether female struggles against male authorities or homosexual struggles in a world of heteronormativity. Moving on to literary context. We know that the text belongs to a Gothic genre of the 19th century, where the religious and scientific upheavals of the century triggered a fascination with the Gothic. Similar Gothic settings and spooky supernatural events can be found in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the telltale heart of Edgar Allan Poe. The picture of Dorian Gray may remind us of other texts too. Its portrayal of opium and temptation-filled London brings to mind Charles Dickens' The Mystery of Edwin Drood. We know that Wilde was strongly influenced by the themes of duality seen in Dr Faustus and Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, and we certainly see allusions to these texts in the plot of his novel. Stevenson's 1886 Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, like Dorian Gray, is set in the modern city, from the slums to the houses of the wealthy, hiding secrets behind closed doors. Whilst Jekyll, whilst Jekyll moves in a circle of mild-mannered, socially responsible friends, Hyde is terrifying because he's so unlike them. The possibility of a Hyde within them remains just a possibility, although Stevenson's realism hints that means might be found to unleash it. Dorian, with his supernatural portrait, is frightening because he inhabits a world of predators and pleasure seekers like himself. As the only one who can evade the consequences of his actions, he enjoys watching others live out what might have been his own fate, from the opium addicted Adrian Singleton to Lord Henry, wrinkled and worn and yellow in his later years. Sometime in the 1870s, the term decadence was coined to describe a school of writers and artists who focused on the artificial and urban rather than the natural. By about 1885, they took to call themselves symbolists. The decadence stretched the definition of beauty to encompass the grotesque, the dissident and the marginal. They considered rather than offering moral comment, the artist should embrace intensity of experience for its own sake. We see Basil Howard paint Dorian Gray in the full intensity of his beauty. In turn, Dorian Gray embraces this beauty fully by even selling her soul to the devil for that immortal and eternal beauty. Now for the snap summary of the text. The story begins in the studio of painter Basil Hallward, who is entertaining his old friend, the relentless philosophical Lord Henry Wotton. Basil confides to Henry that he is working on a portrait, the finest he has ever done, depicting a beautiful youth, Dorian Gray who has had an extraordinary influence on him. The influence is so great, in fact, that he refuses to exhibit the picture for fear of the secret passion it reveals. Surprised by this passion in Basil, Henry wants to meet this Dorian Gray. And as luck would have it, Dorian arrives at the studio before Basil can remove Lord Henry. Basil warns Henry that he is not to damage Dorian. He is very serious and protective over the young man. As it turns out, he has a right to worry. Lord Henry brings out his finest display of philosophical chatter for Dorian and the boy is in awe of the new ideas he's introduced to, of hedonism and aesthetics. Basil excitedly finishes his portrait and he has agreed that it is the best thing he has ever done. After hearing Lord Henry's warning that his beauty and youth will fade, Dorian has an extreme response to the portrait. The passing of time and the certainty of his own ageing terrify him and he wishes he could trade places with the portrait, maintaining his youth while, while the paint alters with time. Basil offers to destroy the portrait, Henry offers to keep it for himself, but Dorian has a fascination for it and he decides he alone must have it. Inspired by Lord Henry, Dorian seeks to, begins to seek every experience of life. He goes to parts of London that some people of his social stature never see and finds a shabby theatre performing Shakespeare. Here he falls in love with Sybil Vane, a beautiful young actress who embodies Shakespeare's heroines. Her brother Jim Vane does not approve of the match and tells their mother to do a better job of protecting Sybil while he is away at sea. 
but Sybil is in love with her Prince Charming and is determined to marry him. The tragedy strikes when Sybil's new love for Dorian causes her acting to become completely lifeless. Now that she has found real love, she explains, the idea of Romeo is nothing to her. Dorian's heartbroken. He finds he cannot love Sybil without her art and calls off the engagement. When he returns home, Dorian notices that his portrait has, cho has changed somehow. It has grown a cruel exp expression. Could it be that his wish has come true? Dorian is terrified and pledges to make it up to Sybil, but before he can, he receives word that she has killed herself. Dorian becomes haunted by the portrait and hides it, locked in the attic of the, his, his house. But he continues to be affected by Lord Henry's theories, living for the art of experience and pleasure. He loses his remorse for Sybil, influenced especially by a particular book about a beautiful boy just like him. He fills his life with decadence and dangerous explorations. His reputation soars, but he is so charming and wealthy that he is still welcome in the highest of circles. However, when confronted by Basil about the rumours surrounding him, Dorian reveals that the port the, reveals the portrait to Basil and he is so filled with rage by Basil's horrified reaction that he stabs and kills him. Dorian then blackmails a doctor called Alan Campbell to cleanly dispose of Basil's body. Dorian then escapes to opium dens seeking to forget what he has done and the portrait but while there he is attacked by Jim Vane who is looking to avenge his sister's death. Dorian's impossible youthfulness saves him, but the image of Jim haunts him, even when he goes to stay in the country with friends. On a hunting trip, a man is killed accidentally, and it turns out to be Jim Vane, ensuring that Dorian's crimes will never be discovered. Dorian vows that he will become good, but he refuses to turn himself in. When the portrait reveals this hypocrisy, Dorian's hope is lost. In a fit of rage, he grabs a knife and goes to destroy the painting. A terrible cry is heard and when found by the servants, Dorian is, Dorian is lying dead on the floor, old and hideous, while the painting hangs in its original beautiful state. What a lovely story. This marks the end of our snap summary and the end of this video. If this has helped you, comment down below and give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this and click the bell to get notif post notifications whenever I upload. Till next time, stay home, stay safe and see you soon.